Hey guys, it's A. Paul and welcome back to my channel. I've got my bachelor's in criminal justice and a minor in psychology and I'm going to say that for the next 41 videos because I'm just so proud of myself. On top of that, I'm a board member for a nonprofit called Voices for the Silenced and we help families and friends of missing loved ones get resources and help aid in their search as much as we can. So if you have a missing loved one around the West Virginia area, please get a hold of us. And welcome back Back to another one in the Unsolved in West Virginia series. And I'm not gonna lie, this case makes my head spin. And I would like to point out that everything that I found that talked about Melanie and what happened to her is listed in the description below. I am just a girl with Google, guys. <laughs> So if you have a question about any of the information I have, it's somewhere down in there. And I also would like to point out, this is for educational and conversational purposes only. Please do your own research on this case. Really, that's the only way we're gonna be able to move forward is having as many people try to find avenues that could have happened to Melanie as we can, right? Now, when I was researching, this case was a little confusing. There's a lot of different stories going every which way. If I have gotten anything wrong in this case, please put it down in the comments below, preferably kindly and with a source or a way you would know that information so I can put the corrections in the description. And if you haven't already guessed from the title, we are here to talk about Melanie Matheny. So let's just get right in. Melanie was born June 21st, 1985, and she was 21 years old at the time of all this. She was from Bell, West Virginia, and she clearly was female, white, about 5'3", three and around 100 pounds. She had strawberry blonde hair and brown eyes and she had pierced ears. And she did have a scar on her right ankle from a car accident where she got plates and screws put in it. She was known as quiet and reserved and she was very passionate about animal rescue. She did party a tiny bit. It was just a recreational thing, but above all was being a mother, so she put that above everything. Her parents were James and Debbie Matheny, and she had two brothers and a half-sister. She did have three kids. Ryan was three at the time, but was going to turn four in March, and Melanie had him fairly young. Ryan was in the Head Start program at the Morris Enrichment Center at the time of all of this, and he went two days a week. He would come home and tell Melanie, Melanie all about his day at school and he just seemed to really like it. And from what I could understand from all my research, Ryan was living with his dad, Michael Lilly, at this time, primarily. But Melanie did see him. She was active in his life. It just made more sense for Ryan to be with Michael, from what I understand. And Nathan was two, but he would be three in October. And he was a little bit spoiled and slept with Melanie and her fiance say his dad for about two years for most of his life. Now he did go to daycare pretty much every day and he was sad because he was so attached to Melanie but once she left his whole day was great. And then the last one she had was Hannah and she was one. She would be two also in March and Melanie described her as the sweetest and not shy at all. She did really well in daycare at this time and during all this was when she was learning to walk. Now Melanie graduated from Riverside High School and she was working on becoming a nurse. She went to Garnet Career Center and she was trying to take as many college credits as she could there before she pursued going to West Virginia State University. And like I said, she wanted to go for nursing but she wanted to focus on pediatrics. I know I've already said this, but I just want to reiterate how devoted of a mother Melanie was. Everyone that knew her, that's what they talked about a lot, was just how great of a mom she was, even 
in the hardest times. And I wanna talk about her relationships just a little bit. The one she had with Michael Lilly, who was Ryan's dad, I couldn't really find a whole lot on. So I guess I can assume it wasn't necessarily a nasty breakup, right? But she did start seeing Matthew Harper. And when they were together, they lived at Matthew's mom's, Donna. And they did this so Melanie could go to work and Matthew could go to school and work and have, you know, care for Ryan. And then the two they ended up having together, Nathan and Hannah. And Donna and Melanie were really close close. They had a great relationship. Now, like I said, they had Hannah and Nathan together. And even after they broke up, Melanie did have full custody, but they were able to see their dad whenever they wanted. It was very loose. But Matthew was rumored allegedly I don't know, this is just what was talked about on the internet, that he was jealous and sometimes that would be really over the top. And there was even a rumor that he had taken fuses out of her car so she couldn't drive anywhere so he knew she was home or where he knew she was at all times at this point. And it did seem in their relationship, allegedly, that he was trying to isolate her from everyone, but like him and his family, you know, his mom, that kind of thing. She did end up ending the relationship in December 2005, but she still had a good relationship with his family, especially Donna. And they just, you know, really worked to co-parent, even if sometimes it wasn't the easiest. And Melanie ended up meeting Jared Davis in March 2006, and they hit it off right away. This was her current boyfriend at the time of her disappearance, and he was also a single parent to a girl named Harley, and they just really bonded over that. And Melanie kind of lived part-time in two separate places. She had a place in Belle with her siblings that she lived part-time at, and then the other part time she lived with Jared in Campbell's Creek. Now from what I understand where Jared and her lived in Campbell's Creek there wasn't a whole lot of service so anytime she would get into town the first thing she would do is like check her phone. She was working really hard to save money and to be able to rent her own like permanent house that she wasn't having to go back and forth between and her and her kids could live there. She also smoked Samoa cigarettes so she did stop at the gas station often. You'll hear about that a little later. And Melanie was just truly a person people didn't have a problem with. Almost everyone loved Melanie from what you heard in the community if they knew her. But if they didn't know her, they truly had never even heard of her because she was so quiet and reserved. So I know we haven't dug a whole lot into this case yet, but knowing that it's just so hard to fathom anybody doing something to her, right? Now, a month before her disappearance, a teenage boy and his friends stole her van and took it on a joyride. It was eventually returned, but it did come back with some minor damages on it. So Melanie made plans to take it to the recommended body shop. Now, a little later, she ended up having an argument with this teenager out in public. The teenager had picked up a rock and went to throw it at her during this, but Melanie's friend saw it and warned Melanie, so the teenager just put the rock down. And then he just took off. Melanie was really upset by this argument because she didn't let people work her up like that. It was completely out of character for her to have an argument in public like that, let alone with a teenager, a child. That just wasn't like her. Starting on July 18th, 2006, I am gonna go ahead and warn you, this is where so many different versions of the story happen. I'm going to try to make it as easily digestible as possible, but just bear with me. This part is going to be a little confusing. Now, this was one of the days that Melanie stayed with Jared in Campbell's Creek. And around 9 a.m., Melanie's grandma, Sandra, brought Hannah and Nathan 
back from a sleepover at her house. Melanie opened the door and talked a little bit with them and everything seemed perfectly normal. Now Melanie and the kids went to go spend the day with her sister and friend Stephanie and Chris and Melanie had asked her sister Stephanie multiple times to spend the next day with her running errands but Stephanie really just didn't ever say okay and so I do think she also was trying to ask Chris but Chris kind of blew it off too. Now one version of the story goes this way. Melanie, Stephanie, and Chris brought her children to the park near the Charleston Moose Lodge and then once they were done hanging out there they went back to the Campbell's Creek apartment she shared with Jared. Now it is possible that Chris's boyfriend stopped by the apartment and hung out a little bit but it also has been rumored that it was Stephanie's boyfriend. Around 7 to 7 30 p.m. she did bring Stephanie back to their place on Midland Avenue and then took Chris home on Central Avenue I think. But here's another version of that day. They went to Chris's place instead of going to the park and instead of going to her apartment she shared with Jared. Therefore Melanie didn't drive anyone home because she didn't go and get Stephanie and Chris. They just spent the whole day at Chris's house. And at the end of the day in both versions Melanie ends up going and staying at Jared in her place that night with Hannah, Harley, and Nathan there. On July 19th the next day she had plans on getting her transcripts from Garnet Career Center and bringing them to West Virginia State University to register for classes. And she told multiple people this. I mean almost every single person she talked to she told these were her plans. Jared left for work around 7 a.m. and Melanie was already up getting the kids ready. She at this time told Jared she was going to get her transcripts from Garnet. Now when she got into town she broke a habit that we saw her do almost every day. She was in Campbell's Creek that I mentioned earlier which was checking her phone when she got into service. She didn't do that this day. Around 7 30 she dropped Harley off at Jared's mom's house in the Dry Branch area. And when she dropped Harley off, she talked to Jared's siblings because Jared's sister wanted to take Harley to the water park. So Melanie asked her, do you want me to go back and get a bathing suit? But Jared's sister said, oh, we'll just figure it out. It's no big deal. And while she was there, she had mentioned going to get her transcripts. But she seemed fine while she talked to Jared's siblings and didn't really seem to be in that big of a rush. She then drove down Route 60 to Bell. Around 8 a.m. she dropped Hannah and Nathan off at the Country Kids Daycare around the 300 block of East DuPont Avenue. She talked to the receptionist a little bit in which she also told that she was getting her transcripts from Garnet to take to West Virginia State University and she said she would be back to get the kids around noon. She then goes to 7-Eleven to pick up cigarettes we presume. Around 9 a.m. she calls the recommended body shop and I'm not really sure if this is to ask when her appointment is or to ask about something if the appointment already happened. But this call was placed in a really weird area completely out of the way in like the western Kanawha Eastern Putnam County area and she wasn't really thought to have ever traveled to that area before. But I did see rumors that it was close to where maybe Jared was working so that might be something to it. But around 9 30 there's a call to her voicemail and this one also pinged about 25 miles away in that same area. Around noon she was seen driving at an intersection of Beach Avenue and Hunt Avenue but then there's nothing really to report for six hours. Just radio silence and what could have happened here. And around 6 p.m. is when the daycare started to close and Melanie had never came to pick up the kids. They called her multiple times without 
any contact. So then they ended up calling Donna and Donna was absolutely shocked. Melanie didn't do this type of thing. So of course she rushed there to get the kids, but she did call Melanie's parents to tell them about this and kind of give them a heads up of something might be happening. And her parents were just as shocked. This was not behavior that Melanie presented. Jim, her dad, and her grandma, Sandra, ended up driving to the Campbell's Creek apartment. Jared was home, but Melanie was not there. He didn't seem very um, surprised that they couldn't find or hear from Melanie. And he pretty much told them that he had gotten up to leave for work around seven. He knew that Melanie left around 7.15 to 7.20 with the kids. He said Melanie told him that she was going to go get her transcripts from Garnet. And he said he tried to call her around noon and she didn't answer, but maybe she was, you know, doing the things with schooling she needed to do. And something just a tad bit weird was he did refused to help with any search that had to do with Melanie. And Melanie's family searched all night for Melanie and her van with no answers at all. Now Melanie's dad reported her and her van missing and it was followed up on the next day. And it did seem like news outlets immediately reported her description and van information. And she was almost immediately classified as an endangered missing person. One of the first things the police did was search the area around Campbell's Creek where she and Jared lived. They used canine units, rescue crews, and family members helped on foot. They searched multiple places, especially in Kanawha County. They searched in mines, mine shafts, and pretty much any area that a tip came in with. It did kind of seem like something was worrying Melanie, and they came to that conclusion because she was asking Stephanie and Chris multiple times to spend this day that she disappeared with her. She was telling every single person she came in contact to about her plans that day. And she kind of changed her usual pattern throughout the day. She didn't check her phone. She wasn't usually up around seven when Jared leaves for work, especially because it was summer and there wasn't very many major obligations. And the police did around 200 interviews in this case. And they received quite a few tips from this. And Jared was questioned multiple times. And he even took a couple lie detector tests. But from my understanding, Jared's completely cleared in this. And when they talked to the daycare staff, Melanie was for sure the one that dropped the kids off. She even had her signature on the sign-in sheet. But they said when she was talking to the staff, she seemed to be in a good mood. And the staff did let the police know that it was clear Melanie was a great mom. Her kids absolutely adored her and they seemed to always be taken care of. Everyone that talked to the police that talked to her that day said Melanie seemed completely fine. And the recommended body shop worker that talked to Melanie even guaranteed that that was her voice that they talked to. But when the police went to Garnet and West Virginia University, Melanie had never shown up there to either one. Now, like I said, hundreds of tips came in and they followed up with every single one. Now there was a woman seen walking on Delaware Avenue that looked like Melanie. The person that saw her came home and saw Melanie on the news missing and immediately called the police to tell them about it. And people also claimed that there was a red SUV they saw with a woman who looked like Melanie completely drugged out of her mind in the seat of this car. Now Matthew, Hannah and Nathan's dad. He worked at air gas facility on Oregon Street and around 4 p.m. he went out for a smoke break and saw a red SUV. He said it was like a Ford Explorer and it was parked across the street and there was a white woman with blonde hair that was trying to escape 
the SUV, but she just kept getting pulled back in. And she just kept screaming, what about my babies? What about my babies? But the woman was ultimately pulled back into the Ford Explorer. Now, someone else that was there ended up getting a partial license plate of this SUV. And it is either 9EY735 or 7EY935. The SUV and the woman were never identified, but police never rolled out that this was Melanie. And I just want to put out there that the car and woman wasn't close enough for Matthew to recognize that to be in Melanie immediately. So in his head, he didn't even know anything was going on with Melanie at this point. Nobody knew she was missing yet. So it never even clicked that maybe this is Melanie, maybe I need to call police. And it just didn't you know, it didn't register to him that it could be the mother of his children because he thought she was safe. Now let's talk about her van. She had a 1998 gold Chevrolet Ventura van. Four days after her disappearance on July 23rd, 2006, her van was found on the Charleston's west side. It was parked near Wyoming Street and Embayring Avenue. And this area is known for its drug activity. Now the doors were locked on the van and it just looked like it had been abandoned. And when you look inside there was a camera, CDs, a Bell Police Department business card, and a piece of paper for a phone number that someone was renting a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house. And it was written that rent was $1,500. There was also WIC identification papers and the car seats, but the things that were missing were her purse, her phone, her debit card, and WIC cards. And people in that area said that van had been there since around 2 p.m. on July 19th, the day Melanie went missing. The van had been completely wiped clean of any fingerprints, including Melanie's. And the van did not give us any clues on what happened to Melanie, or let alone how it got onto the west side of Charleston. The family doesn't necessarily believe that the police did the best job from my understanding of everything on the internet, allegedly, all that. So the family and loved ones of Melanie really started to try to figure out some answers to questions they had. And the main push in all of this was Melanie's grandma, Sandra. It didn't really make sense that Melanie would willingly leave. She was making changes in her life and her kid's life for the better. She was getting into school to be a nurse. She was saving money for a permanent place for all of them to stay. And everything in her life seemed to be falling into line at this time. Why willingly leave now? Now, the family didn't know Jared very well. They had only been dating a few months, so they did have some questions regarding him. And the family also had made their own series of events that they think Melanie did that day. They think she left her apartment around 7.15 to 7.30, and she stopped at her home in Midland Avenue in Bell first. A neighbor saw Melanie around 7.40 that morning, and Melanie had kind of waved her down and talked to her for a second. And the woman said she thought her conversation was kind of like why she had named Hannah, Hannah, kind of small talking. And this neighbor said she thought she saw three kids in the car, which is why they think she came here first. They think she then stopped at 7-Eleven. Someone had claimed they saw her drive back to Midland Avenue, but do a U-turn there and then drove to Country Kids Daycare. And they think that she went to the daycare before dropping Harley off because the daycare workers thought they saw three kids in Melanie's car also. She then dropped Harley off at Jared's mom's house. But I would like to say that Harley swears she was dropped off first that day. And Jared's sister, the one that wanted to take her to the water park, also insisted that 
Harley was dropped off first. Come to your own conclusions on that one, I guess. The family also doesn't believe that Melanie was the one that called the recommended body shop. I do want to remind you that the worker also would guarantee this was Melanie he talked to, but the family does wonder if it was someone else. There were some people that are kind of questionable why the police didn't talk to right away. One of them was Steph Stephanie, her sister. Now Stephanie did move out of state just days after her disappearance with no explanation that I could find. So maybe that's why they couldn't find her. But they also didn't talk to Chris, Stephanie's friend that she spent the day before with. And it has been rumored that Chris was told and kind of pressured to stay quiet. They also didn't talk to Jared's family until 2011, five years later. Family also thought it was a little weird that law enforcement would not invite the FBI into the case. The family had hired multiple private investigators that seemed to be scared off the case. Now, when she was featured on America's Most Wanted, they tried to contact the Kanawha County Sheriff's Office multiple times, and they just kept missing their calls for 18 months. And I have seen that Harley is pretty upset with the fact that people try to blame her dad in this. And I feel for her because he was completely cleared. She said he loved Melanie and he would have done anything for her. She witnessed it. So for him to still be rumored that he's involved somehow, it does. It bothers Harley and I can understand why. All right, <laughs> buckle up for one of the most wild parts in this video. We are going to talk about Joey Jeffrey. He was a known drug dealer around the Charleston, Kanawha County area. Him and Sydney Crothers were arrested at the Knights Inn in Kanawha City. They had kidnapped Joey's cousin, Liana Quinn from Witcher's Creek, and he was quickly thought to be a person of interest in Melanie's case. He was never charged though, but let me explain to you why he's a person of interest. They had reached a plea bargain from being arrested from the kidnapping, and Cindy said that she would testify against Joey. She had admitted to helping Joey kidnap Liana. Is it Liana? I think it's Liana. Shoot. She had admitted to helping Joey kidnap Leanna on December 8th, 2012. She said that Joey allegedly threatened Leanna, and he said to her, do you remember Melanie Matheny? I will put you in the same hole I put her in. And she pled guilty to conspiracy to commit first degree robbery with threat of deadly force. And she was sentenced to one to five years of prison. And in April, 2014, he was convicted of second degree robbery, malicious wounding, and assault. And he got 24 years in prison, and then he can be eligible for parole. Now the children were taken care of. Ryan, of course, was still just living with his dad. And Hannah and Nathan were taken in by Donna, Matthew's mother. Melanie's family started a charity called Melanie's Hope, and it's dedicated to raising awareness for missing people. It also helped support animal rescue since she was so passionate about that. And in 2019, there was a tree planted in Coonskin Park near a pond in memorial for Melanie. And this type of tree symbolizes strength and perseverance. If you guys know anything about Melanie Matheny, please contact somebody. I am about to give you all the resources you can use. So if you even know just a tiny detail, it could help fit a whole puzzle together. It could be the missing piece. So please contact somebody. You can contact the Kanawha County Sheriff's Office at 304-357-0169. There is also a tip line you can contact 304-357-4693 and their email is tips at kanawsheriff.com 
.us. All calls can be anonymous, all tips can be anonymous, and tips can usually be kept confidential from the public. I do want to give you her name is number just in case you would need that, and that is MP. 418. And then there's the Q Center for Missing Persons. This is also a 24-hour tip line and their number is 910-232-1689. What do you guys think about this case? It's just so hard to wrap my head around because I feel that she literally just vanished out of thin air and I just thank God every day that her kids were in safe air areas when whatever happened to her happened to her. But like I said, if you know anything, please contact somebody. But thank you guys so much for watching. Like and subscribe for me and hit that notification button. That way you're notified the next time I upload. I still have a GoFundMe going for Crystal Young. So if you haven't watched that video already, you need to go do that and see why her mom needs those PI so bad. I still have stickers for sale. They're $2 each and all proceeds go to the Cold Case Foundation. So it is for a good cause. And thank you guys again so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.